Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, for this lecture in 268R. Um, uh, before I forget, uh, you know, normally we have a discussion session the day after every lecture, and we've had some very entertaining and interesting discussion sessions after every lecture so far. Uh, so, uh, but tomorrow, okay, being Saturday, I am a little busy, and the discussion session, how you has kindly agreed to uh, lead that discussion session for tomorrow. So it'll happen, but not with me. Um, okay, so we are uh, going to discuss the boson Hubbard model again today. So this uh, novel feature of this model, which we haven't seen so far in the other systems we looked at, is that we are going to see an example of, or have already seen to some extent, uh, a phase transition. In fact, a phase transition at zero temperature between two different phases uh, of some many body system. In this case, the two phases are insulators and superfluids. And as you vary some coupling, uh, you can uh, you can see this transition. So you take bosons here moving on a lattice. Right? In fact, it doesn't matter what the lattice is in this simple model very much. At the level, we're going to discuss it uh, in how many dimensions it seems to work. This basic discussion is true almost everywhere. So you have some boson that can hop from site to site with an amplitude W. Uh, and then they, when two of them get on the same site, there's a repulsion U. So that's so that immediately gives you some dimensionless parameter, which is W over U. So that's the one measure of uh, how, uh, how strong the interactions are. Well, okay. But there's a second parameter. So we're going to have a two dimensional phase diagram. Uh, the second parameter is the chemical potential or equivalently the density. Uh, and we, it's preferable here, as you've already seen, to use the chemical potential rather than the density as your free parameter, because the density, it will turn out to have a rather discontinuous dependence on parameters uh, in some regimes. All right. So this model uh, can't be solved exactly. There's no exact solution even in one dimension. Uh, but there is a mean field theory, which is pretty good. And I described a variational approach to obtaining that mean field theory uh, on Wednesday. And, let me, and the, you could also use the naive mean field uh, approach where you just condense certain operators uh, and you get the same answer. Uh, the, the variational approach has, of course, some it's better because it makes you feel better that you're always under control from the variational principle. So let me, so basically it reduces to the following solution. So in the mean field limit, uh, we write the Hamiltonian as the sum over sites of some Hamiltonian H0, which only depends on one site, site I. So, so in the rest of the mean field considerations, we only focus on one site. So you reduced everything to a single site problem. Uh, and this H0 has the same uh, chemical potential and interaction term uh, as the original Hamiltonian. I've just dropped the index I because I'm referring to any generic site, just a single site. But it has this additional term, uh, which involves this uh, free parameter psi. And how is that parameter determined? Well, in the variational principle to determine minimizing the energy, uh, but in, uh, in the mean field calculation is determined by factorizing the hopping term. Either way, you get the same expression, which is that psi must equal this, where z is the coordination number, w is the hopping, uh, the nearest neighbor hopping. And this quantity is the expectation value of b in this Hamiltonian H0. So you have a circular procedure, you pick a psi, you evaluate this, and you keep going until you iterate and find a solution. Okay, that's a bit complicated because this zero site Hamiltonian is not exactly solvable, but you can still solve it in perturbation theory in psi, and that's pretty much sufficient for our purposes. So when you go through that procedure, uh, you get this sort of phase diagram. Uh, and we're actually going to get it again today by another method where I actually do, I will pretty much do the full calculation. So assuming things go according to plan. 
so here's the one axis, which is the chemical potential. And here's, we choose the hopping as our free parameter. So weak interactions are way out here. So our previous work was way out here with very weak interactions. Uh, and now this axis is the axis of infinitely strong interaction, where there's no hopping at all of the bosons. And in this axis of infinitely strong interaction, the number of bosons on each side is always an integer. Uh, and here the integer is one, here is two and three or zero, which is just the empty state in the grand canonical ensemble. And this entire region, then uh, the number of bosons is fixed. So this is, we call this the mod insulator. Uh, and 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 this remains fixed over there. Uh, and then this region where psi condenses, uh, well, where psi is not equal to zero, that's smoothly connected to the weak interaction limit where it's a superfluid. Okay. And this whole region here is just empty space. There's no bosons at all down here at n equals zero. So here there's one, here there's two, and so on. All right, so that's the summary of uh, some of the things we discussed last time. Are there any questions uh, so before we take this picture further? Uh, I have a question. Yes, Yandy. Uh, so the boundary for n equals to zero, I think it's it, it's the slope like negative one all the way to large w, is that? Uh, valid all the way to big W over U? Um, I think that's correct. I don't fully remember. So, yeah, actually, I, I can, I think we can understand that. So, let's try to understand, as you're suggesting, this region over here. Okay, so let's start with the empty state. Okay. Uh, so, we just all we're doing here, actually, before I answer your question, let me say one more thing. Uh, which will be very relevant. Uh, so one thing you can do uh, is you can go back to this uh, this Hamiltonian here, and just compute the density in the superfluid phase. I already told you the density in the mod insulator is fixed at these integer values. What is the density in the superfluid phase? So what you will find when you do that uh, is, uh, let me use some other color here. Uh, that for example, here the density is one, and what you typically find that if you go from the tip of the lobe straight out, there's some line is not necessarily straight where the density is one. And then there's a similar line here where the density is two. So that's the contour of equal density in the superfluid is some strange curve. The density keeps changing as you vary couplings uh, for fixed chemical potential. So these are iso density. the blue lines are the iso density lines. Then what about between one and two? Well, between one and two, uh, they all squeeze down to this one point here, for example. So here would be something like uh, n equals 1.1 and maybe n equals 1.5 will go out straight. And, you know, this could be n equals 1.8 and so on. And, so down here to come to your question, uh, if you go straight out from this point, this will be n equals 0 0.5. That's suppose on that half filling. Uh, and then and then here, if you come very close to this phase boundary, that would be n equals 0 0.1. So what's happening? So this this phase transition is kind of rather simple is just you start with an empty state and then you end up with a superfluid with a very dilute Bose gas. Okay, uh, but the dilute Bose gas is something we've already studied. So let's ask what happens across this boundary. This is really the simplest boundary, so that's a great question. Uh, so there you start with a dilute Bose gas, okay? So let's just first start with a non-interacting Bose gas and write down its Hamiltonian. Uh, let me take another color. So, so near n equals zero. No, please write. Okay, there. 
when a Hamiltonian is just we ignore the interactions because the Bose gas is so dilute uh, is uh, minus W sum over nearest neighbors. Let's take the exact Hamiltonian now. B dagger I B J plus B J dagger B I. And then you you have to include the chemical potential sum on I and I. That's it. And uh, we will forget about the interactions because the gas is so dilute that the bosons never see each other. Okay, so now I can just take a Fourier transform of this. If you write this in momentum space, this is just a tight binding model. It'll be uh, EK minus mu in Fourier space, B dagger K, BK, where EK, so I hope you've all seen a tight binding model somewhere. If you haven't, look it up in some quantum mechanics book. So in one, let's say, imagine it's one dimension, would be minus two W cosine K. So if you plot that as a function of K, you know, here's K, K goes from minus pi to pi, lattice spacing is one, and this dispersion uh, looks something like this. All right, so that's the dispersion. It has the smallest value here is minus two W. Now let's look at the chemical potential. So basically what's gonna happen boson at zero temperature, if the chemical potential is here below minus two W, you're not gonna have any bosons at all because the chemical potential is so negative, the energy is also positive. So you just don't want any bosons. I mean, this goes back to the fact that when you have no interactions, bosons only appear when the chemical potential is above above zero for a k squared dispersion, but here we don't have a k squared dispersion. But once the chemical potential is here, this is mu. Now these are not fermions, but anyway, once it becomes positive, it pays to have bosons. And these bosons will condense. So this is just a dilute Bose gas. So we have an exact result, at least in one dimension. Actually, this in, in any dimension will become Z. So this result here, this, this line is just mu equals minus ZW. Z is the coordination number. Because when you go very far out, it becomes, you know, right? The boundary is exactly that, in fact. In fact, this line, there are no corrections to this boundary at zero temperature. Uh, actually, even and it's just basically straight. I, yeah, I should have drawn it straight. It's just equal to that. Basically, when the chemical potential goes above the bottom of the band. So this, uh, so this kind of phase transition is, uh, you know, it's it's not really. It doesn't even deserve the term phase transition. Although formally it is a phase transition, it's just an empty space where you add a few bosons and they condense. So that's. You can view that as a phase transition. Uh, if you want to think of empty space as a, as, a, as a phase of the universe and the filled space in another phase. So, I mean, that can be very useful for some things, but it's not the kind of phase transitions that will get somebody working on phase transition that excited. Although there are a lot of interesting things about it. <laughs> okay, so I think I, I, hopefully I answered your question then. So that's the equation of the line and that's actually has no corrections. That is the exact position. Uh, of the phase boundary from the vacuum to the dilute gas. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Um, other questions? Okay, so now before I start, so the phase transition we really want to address uh, is a phase transition that will turn out this one, the fixed density phase transition. See, every one of the, uh, every, everywhere else, as you go across the boundary, changing the density. Here, the density is one. Uh, and, you know, when you go this way, the density will be 1.1 or something everywhere, but except on this line where it will stay the same. And that turns out to be by far much more interesting, uh, that blue dot over there. So that's kind of where we're moving towards this thing, the tip of the lobe. Uh, and there are many experiments that have studied that, in fact. Um, but before I go there, let me just say a few more things about you know, these mod insulators. I've kind of already said something about this mod insulators. It's a, 
again, it's a very trivial state. It's just three bosons moving about the vacuum. Uh, what about somewhere here? What is the nature of this mode insulator or, or somewhere over here? So, so this and beyond mean field, you know, so we've got this strange result in mean field theory that the density doesn't vary at all uh, as you vary the chemical potential. Uh, is that really true? And what are the nature? So this is a new phase of matter we found. It's an insulator. Uh, what are the excitation? Does it have quasi particles? What are the quasi particles? Okay. So, and okay. So, so that's the question we can ask and answer fairly easily. So we just talk about now the excitations of the mod insulator. So let me let me take a general pod insulator. Here is my lattice. And let's say there are in the insulator, uh, let's make that all purple. Let's say there are N bosons sitting there. On every side. Okay. And every time I have to move a boson, I find I can't do it um, because it costs a lot of energy. So, but let, let's imagine we're in the grand canonical ensemble. I want to now think about some excitation. So from, from either from a reservoir or somewhere else in the sample, uh, I bring in and put an extra boson here. So this extra boson maybe sits here. Okay. But now this, I, but it could sit there, it could sit, here it could sit there. So there's a degeneracy. There are n places it can sit. If I have one extra boson, n is the size of the system. Uh, and they all have the same energy. So as a quantum mechanic, you say, ah, oh, well, I have to do degenerate perturbation theories to in the hopping because these are these degenerate states. And what is the degenerate, you know, what is the thing that breaks the degeneracy? Well, that's of course the, the hopping from here to there. It can hop from here to there. And, and that will couple it together. And you can see right away that you just get a tight binding model of this boson moving around, uh, much like this model that we began with, with one difference. Uh, and the difference is if there are N bosons to begin with, so there are N bosons here, N bosons in purple. So the matrix element for this boson to hop uh, has this uh, Bose enhancement factor that I discussed yesterday. It will be N plus one times W. Uh, and why is there a matrix element of N plus one extra factor? Well, because when you have N plus one bosons here, so this particular site is going from N plus one in the initial state. And when this is moved over, uh, it's got only N in the final state. And so the this B operator, which takes you from N plus one to N, will give you a factor of square root of N plus one. And conversely, you get from this side also a factor of square root of n plus one. So together you get a factor of n plus one times w. So this tells me that the boson has moves much faster or has much more hopping around, uh, the greater the number of bosons that were there before. This is the Bose enhancement factor. It's the same factor that gives you a laser, right? It's, it's sort of like these bosons are, uh, uh, um, you know, have this, n plus one factor from the post statistics uh, and they're coherently, this is like stimulated hopping, if you wish, of a boson from one side to the other. <laughs> it becomes faster and faster the more bosons they were to begin with. So it's a very coherent object in that sense. Uh, okay, and so, that, and so then what is the actual energy of the excitations? Well, the energy of the excitations, uh, and this let me call it the energy of a particle-like excitation, Well, what is what is the energy? Well, first of all, you have to pay an energy U to bring the boson there to begin with. Uh, and uh, I guess let's let's just imagine we are sitting. It depends on the chemical potential a little bit, but let's imagine you're sitting at the center. So when you add one boson to this point, you will go to that point, and the separation between them is exactly U. 
So we have the particle also. So the, the particle like excitation, the U, and then you'll get some hopping, uh, which will be minus two W again in one dimension, N plus one times cosine of K. So it'll be just like this picture, except uh, there's an extra factor of U here from, uh, from the fact that there were bosons there to begin with. Uh, at this particle hole symmetric point. Uh, so, well, well uh, let me just say at the middle of the lobes, you can work out what it is elsewhere. Uh, yeah, okay. And then if you remove a boson, so if you remove a boson here, well, this hole can also hop around. Uh, and, you know, let's say this hole is hopped here to the, the other side. Uh, there you get a matrix element of N times W, not N plus one. So this is the hole-like excitations. E hole as a function of K would also be cost you an energy U minus two W N times cosine K. So if you now plot this, and where am I here? Uh, not possible. Uh, so if you plot now the excitation very schematically, Here, um, there's some. It always costs some energy. So this is say the, uh, you know, there'd be some cosine band like this. And this is the particles. And if the particle is symmetric, there'll be the holes, uh, which will be a slightly narrower band. Uh, sorry, narrower band means they become flatter. Uh, something like that. And these are the holes. And but the important point is that there's a gap. So there's a gap to all Bose excitations, uh, and as and because of that, you know, even if you add one add one particle, it costs you some energy, and that's why you never add a particle. Your ground state just remains at the same n, and and that's pretty much the argument why uh, uh, why this dense this number of average number of particles is independent of W as long as you're in this phase. The only the only way uh, you start getting particles uh, and the density start varying is if you close the gap. Uh, if this gap closes, uh, and and that precisely happens on this purple on this purple line here. Okay. Okay. So now you know we know something about the two phases. We we've, we've learned about superfluids before. Superfluids are in this language, compressible phases where the density can be anything you want as you change the chemical potential. Uh, they have a broken uh, symmetry. This number conservation symmetry is broken. They have a condensate and their excitations are phonons or second sound, which are gapless, whose energy goes to zero as momentum goes to zero. On the other hand, in an insulator, the density is fixed. It's commensurate, has to be exactly an integer number uh, per site. And there's a gap to all excitations. Uh, but, but these excitations, once they're created, is, you know, are completely coherent excitations. They will just hop through the lattice very coherently uh, with this extra Bose enhancements factor uh, coming from the fact that they're coherent excitations moving through the lattice. They'll collide with each other with some dilute gas picture at finite temperature, uh, much like uh, you know dilute gas picture in a in sodium chloride. I mean, if you took sodium chloride and heated it up, you get some charges, some dilute gas, some charges moving around, positive and negative charges. And here you get uh, bosons, which are, uh, you know, particle-like or hole-like, either vacancies or extra particles. Okay, so that's a summary of the two phases 
and roughly the phase diagram and uh, and now the main remaining thing we want to address is the nature uh, of this of this phase boundary what happens these simple pictures are valid at low enough energies far from this phase boundary and now we want to get close to the phase boundary uh, and see what happens now actually we can i've already said enough for you to now see what happens across this phase boundary across if i basically what happens across any of these phase boundary except the very is exactly what happened here at zero density uh, what we saw at zero density is that you just added a few bosons over the vacuum and that little extra bosons both condense and that's exactly what happens at any of the mod lobes really uh, so for example if you're coming down here you're increasing the density so you're just adding a few holes so the only thing that a particle so the only thing that matters is not the density of 1.1. What matters is the density of 0.1. So just the extra bosons will condense to give you this uh, superfluid here. So we're very weak superfluid here, just like the, the, all the bosons condensed here. Here only the extra ones. The 0.1 will condense here, the 0.1 will condense there, and so on. And coming across this way, the holes will condense because you're decreasing the density. So there it's a Bose condensate of holes. Here it's a Bose condensate uh, of particles. And the, really the only thing left over then is this point where you have both particles and holes. And there you get some, some very beautiful new, new results that uh, we will start discussing, moving towards today. Okay, any questions? All right, so to address this superfluid to insulator transition in a more systematic way, uh, we have we need a new formalism. And that formalism is really the path integral, which is fundamentally the, I mean, we're going to find path integrals quite useful as we go along. Uh, a very useful way to think about things in many body systems. Uh, and so we want to reformulate everything in terms of a path integral uh, and then see, and the end, it gives you a way of thinking about not just mean field theory, but beyond mean field theory in a way that also applies near a phase boundary, at least potentially applies. It has its own problems, but it's really the, the method of choice uh, for, for addressing non-trivial uh, phase transitions or especially quantum transitions. Sorry, can, okay. can I have a question? Um... Yes, please, go ahead. So uh, you you said that like at this uh, the, this boundaries of um, n equal one mod insulator like above like surplus particles condense and uh, below like, condense. But what if we draw a line that is like relatively close to the um, to the vertical axis like horizontally, because then it's like simultaneously. No 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 close yeah. to the close to the vertical axis. Uh, and and the line is vertical as well. And here? Um, oh, here, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And then basically, yeah. there is it's it, like the picture is on one hand, it's holes condensed from n equal two, and particles condensed from n equal one. So how does the intuition work there? Well, I mean, so there's a very rapid crossover. I mean, you're always closer to two one than the other. So you have to be close enough to this boundary, closer, much closer to this boundary than to that boundary. And only in that, in that window will that picture work if these, and vice versa on that side. So here the, partic the whole particle picture will work there, the whole picture will work. And in between, yeah, very rapidly you cross over from one to the other. And yeah, that's not a simple regime. Uh, of course, there's other problems here, like, uh, like I mentioned last time, you know, this approximation of only including on-site interactions breaks down very badly here. Any real system will also have second, first neighbor, third neighbor interactions. And that also changes the picture here completely. Uh, and like we discussed yesterday, I know uh, uh, in some sense, most of the rest of the course is to try to figure out all the wonderful things that can happen here. <laughs> and all kinds of new types of phases can emerge not just in this system, but other related systems, but that are really will be more focused here anyway, which are very similar at some level. Uh, yeah. 
But there's also a related issue here. I mean, again, whether you go there or there, uh, and there also it's just a question of which, you know, there's some, what we call a crossover between two different universality classes. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, that becomes more complicated and let's not worry about it. Let's just consider the pure case. So, but it's still an exact a correct statement that everywhere along this pink line, except at the blue dot, if I'm close enough, close enough to the phase boundary, in particular, closer than the distance to the blue dot, then I can just think of it as both condensation holes. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, then you might ask, you know, well, then why do I care about this very special point? No real experiment will ever be at that point. But you can see actually it's easy to be at that point. You just fix the density of bosons. You don't uh, you don't allow any extra bosons to go in and out of your system, starting from the mod insulator, and you will necessarily cross at the tip. So you can easily be at that point. <laughs> system will naturally go there. All right. So as I said, uh, any other questions? Good question. Any other similar or more difficult questions. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do the path integral. So we're going to start with this exactly the same Hamiltonian uh, and rewrite it as a path integral. So what you've learned in section, and uh, we also discussed this for the Bose gas, um, you, you just, the Bose field becomes a complex field in imaginary time uh, on each side, which is periodic in time. Uh, and there, there's a there's one term in the path integral which implements the fact that uh, the boson the boson commutation relation, um, and that's this term here, b dagger d b d tau. Now b is a classical field which fluctuates as a function of time on each side, uh, and then the rest of the terms are just basically the Hamiltonian itself. And I'm working in imaginary time because the eyes are a lot simpler. Uh, there are no eyes anywhere. <laughs> this term actually is complex, even in imaginary time. You can just see by integrating by parts that this thing uh, is always purely imaginary, actually. Uh, uh, so the only subtlety here, or perhaps uh, you haven't seen before, uh, is that, and related to a question that Juven one asked, once asked, uh, why am I keeping track of this minus one term over there. Uh, why don't I just write it as n squared? Uh, well, first of all, this is the correct form of it. Uh, but you also, when you did the path integral, what you learned was that when you had a bunch of nonlinear terms in the action, what you have to do in writing another path integral is you have to normal order them, that you have to put all the daggers to the left of the undaggers. So when you normal order this object here with the minus one, it has a very simple normal ordered form. Uh, it just turns out to be this thing, B dagger, B dagger, B, B on the same side. Okay, so the minus one is gone from the normal ordering and you're back to something that looks uh, like a form that you might expect more naively. Okay, so this is then the path integral we have to evaluate. All right, uh, so, so what we did in the mean field theory was treat the hopping term approximately. We, we, we kept all these terms exactly and we treated the hopping term approximately. So again, exactly what we did in the derivation of the Ginsburg-Landau theory for superconductivity, we are going to do exactly the same thing here. We're going to take the term we treated approximately, which in this case couples different sites uh, and decouple it by hubbard turnovich transformation, okay? So I can take this path integral, which is only a path integral over dB. I can convert it exactly to a path integral over d psi dB. Uh, and, and here's the answer, and I'll describe the answer, and then we'll justify it. It has two terms. There's one term 
which is basically a sum over sites. It only involves site each site once. Oops. Uh, and that's why I've written it as a product uh, on I. So you can see it just becomes a, a bunch of path integrals, one on each site. Okay, there's a path integral here, which just involves the site I. And then I take the product over all sites. Okay. And it has an L0 of B and Psi in there. And what is this L0 of B and Psi? Well, that's exactly, first of all, this uh, B dagger D B D tau, that's just telling you the bosons have the commutation relation. It's the same H0 that we had in mean field theory. Exactly this. Now in mean field theory, this was a constant. Uh, which was independent of i and independent of time. Uh, but now uh, the psi is different on different sites and also depends on time. Okay, so this is the form of it. But now psi implicitly in the path integral, as you can see from here, depends on time and site. So it's exactly the same, same Hamilton. But there's a new term which comes from this hubbard tranovitz decoupling of this term, uh, which is this. Um, and what is this strange WIJ? Well, WIJ is, is a matrix, and this is the inverse of that matrix called the adjacency matrix of the lattice. Meaning it's a, I can rewrite this term here. Uh, this term is equal to uh, sum on I, free sum I over J, the matrix WIJ, B dagger I, BJ. Um, plus complex conjugates. So, so this just means that WIJ is a matrix, n by n matrix, we have n sites, uh, and it's equal to one when i and j are nearest neighbors, uh, and equal to zero otherwise. So you take that matrix and you invert it, and, and that's what appears here. Now you might be a little worried here if you're really a stickler for details. Uh, does this matrix have a well-defined inverse, uh, and so on and so forth? And there are some subtleties there, which I'm just going to blindly ignore. Uh, it's discussed in the notes, if you want to think about, read about that. So we just ignore that little uh, difficulty here. Uh, so now, okay, so now you can see why this thing works. If I look at this particular uh, action here, and I suppose I now want to do the integral over psi. If I do the integral over psi, I have this quadratic term here, psi i w i j inverse psi j. And the other place psi appears uh, is in H0, where it just appears linearly. Um, yeah, just appears linearly. So as in all hubbard chitanovich transformation, the whole transformation is nothing more than complete the square. So I just invite you to complete the square here for psi, then you can do the psi integral and, and then you'll come back to this form. All right, so everyone with me now? So, so far, this is all exact. Modulo some, uh, some funny stuff with uh, negative eigenvalues of WIJ, which you can take care of, but just allow me to ask you to read the book on that. <laughs> It, you can make it exact, just you can take care of it. Well, let's not worry about it. <laughs> okay. All right, so now, but of course, if you do the integral over psi, uh, you come back to the original problem. Uh, but we like, we don't want to do the integral over side. The reason we don't want to, because you know it's got this H0 that we already found so useful. Um, that this again is exactly the same strategy uh, as for the landau ginzburg theory of superconductivity. Uh, we're going to do the integral over B first. So you, you introduce a psi integral, and then you exchange the order of integration. We're going to do this integral over B. Now that's a lot easier, even though it's not trivial because that integral uh, doesn't couple the site. So it's just an integral, path integral over a single site. 
Okay, a path integral over single site is just quantum mechanics. So it's some kind of time dependent quantum mechanics problem that we have to solve for the quantum mechanics of the boson B in the presence of a time dependent psi. So it's like a time dependent perturbation theory effectively. You have some time dependent psi uh, on any site and you just have to do the path integral over the bosons, meaning you have to uh, uh, figure out the time evolution of the unity time evolution operator of that Hamiltonian of bosons in the presence of this psi. Uh, you said that it's like a uh, time dependent perturbation theory, but uh, why, uh, why is it justified to treat psi as just a perturbation? Uh, it's not, <laughs> okay. But our hope, yeah, good point. Our hope is that uh, when we are close to this phase boundary, even here, uh, psi is going to zero on this side. So maybe we can work with psi being small when we are close to the phase boundary. Okay, thank and that's you. Exactly the, that's exactly the reasoning also in landau ginzburg theory. You know, why did they stop in cycle the force? Yeah. So we'll get something very much like landau ginzburg theory in a few minutes. All right, so hopefully you have now see you see that all I have to do now is do one path integral, path integral just one field B of tau in this Hamilton, this L zero where L zero is this thing with an H zero we know very well. Okay, so in general, uh, this is a complicated thing. I mean, even if you, it's sort of like the problem of if you just had a you know, a much simpler problem, just a two-level system uh, in some external magnet, uh, two-level system in an external field, which is an arbitrary time dependence. That's not so easy to solve. It leads to all these Floquet equations and complicated things. Uh, so we're going to try to do, the only thing we know how to do is assume psi uh, is uh, small and very slowly. And then afterwards, you go back and check if those assumptions made sense. So let's first begin with psi constant. Okay, suppose psi is constant. Then we can solve this exactly, at least in principle. I can put it on a computer and solve it on very, very quickly because of this very important observation here. Uh, you know, what is the path integral? Well, that's just the trace of some Hamiltonian. You know, this thing is, if you wish, this is precisely equal to, uh, let me write it in a different way. Uh, this thing, well, different color. This thing is equal to trace for time independent psi only for this case, trace e to the minus beta h naught. So it's gonna be some function of psi. And this may, and now we are working at very low temperatures, so that basically I want the ground state energy. So this L1 here, this L1, when you do the integral over tau, since everything is time independent, you get a factor of beta. So L1 is just the ground state energy of uh, uh, of H naught, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Very simple, that's all it is. So now I can uh, uh, work that out. Uh, well, I just I have an H naught here. Here's a perfectly respectable Hamiltonian uh, with some discrete spectrum. I can put it on my computer and just work it out. Oops, I don't want that there. Oh, it's going on. Okay, right here. But I, I, it'll turn out, as uh, I've already said, it's sufficient to do perturbation theory. So now I'm down to just uh, doing perturbation theory in psi, uh, starting with this as my zeroth order Hamiltonian. And that you can just do by looking at it. Uh, you can just see from here what's gonna happen. So let's go to order psi squared. That's a second order perturbation theory. So at order sec, so there's some ground state energy we don't care much about. This is the term uh, second order perturbation theory in H naught. This coefficient chi naught we can get from second order perturbation theory, and here's what it is, where n is whatever the integer is for the mod insulator. You know, this is this is basically coming from the very familiar formula, uh, which is you know 
second order perturbation theory formula sum on n not equal to the, let me not call it m uh, let me call it m or something sum on m not equal to the ground state uh, zero the perturbation which will be let me just call it h1 n squared over e0 minus en so you all remember this from basic quantum mechanics just apply that to this hamiltonian and you will get this so this kind of is something we met uh, on wednesday and didn't give you the derivation but here it is it's really very simple and then you can go to higher order and i won't go to higher order um, you will get some term in order side to the fourth uh, you'll never get any odd terms because of the uh, Psi goes to psi star as a symmetry. Uh, and uh, there's some coupling here, u, which has nothing to do. Let me call it something else. Well, it's small u, not big u. That's what I call it in the notes, so I guess I'll stick to it. This this little u, you can compute by doing, you know, not second order, but fourth order perturbation theory, which is not that easy, but okay. People can know how to do these things uh, in this Hamiltonian. You go order side to the fourth. Okay, so you'll get some number, and really, we want you know, if you care to work it out, you can work it out. All I need is that that number is positive okay. for this whole procedure to make sense. So, somebody's done it, and in fact, I know from the structure of the phase diagram, it has to be positive. If it's negative, the phase diagram would look very different, so it's better be positive. Okay. So we've got this chi naught and some claimed positive number when psi is time independent. Well, what about the time dependence of psi? Well, then it's a little more complicated. Uh, simplest way to do this path integral is to do some diagrams, uh, just like you did for the uh, for the Ginzburg-Landau theory, uh, but uh, here I won't even we won't even need to do that. So here I can make some guesses. So let's just this is time independent. Now let's imagine psi is slowly time dependent, has very low frequencies. Now we did the same thing for the Ginzburg Landau theory, uh, but we run into some trouble there. We, you know, you find all this dissipation and terms that are mod omega, if you may remember that. And that comes because there you're expanding about a Fermi liquid. You start with the Fermi liquid, and then you're looking at the action for superconducting fluctuations near TC. And there's lots and lots of zero energy excitations. But here we're doing something much simpler. Really, we should have done this before we did uh, from PCS theory, but that's not the historical order anyway. You're doing something much simpler. Think of a mod insulator uh, and going to superfluid. Now in the mod insulator itself, where psi is zero, there's a gap. I just told you. So once there's a gap, everything has got to be nice and analytic, and you can take time derivatives without any any worries. So it must come out that you can do a completely gradient expansion in time. There's no no issues with it. So then I just make a guess. So we take time dependent psi, and we make an expansion in time gradients of psi, because this, of course, is only one psi here, or time derivatives of psi. Uh, and basically, you can see that, you know, from the symmetry of the problem of psi, you can rotate the phase of psi. These are the simplest order terms. You can get a term which is first order in time, psi star d psi d tau, and you can get a term that's second order in time, and many other higher order terms. Uh, we won't need any of them near the phase transition. And these two terms we already had from our, uh, from this uh, beautiful identity here. Okay, so, so now the only thing we don't know how to determine, uh, unless you know a little bit of diagrams, uh, is what are the values of K1 and K2. Uh, it turns out, yeah, I don't need to know much about K2 other than it's positive, and it's a little hard to compute also. Uh, but K1 
will be crucial. I need to know exactly what it is uh, and what sign it has. Uh, but there's a trick to getting it. I don't know if I have enough time to do the trick today. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> there's a trick to getting K1. But for now, let's say we know this. So now let's put everything together. So what we have done is we've, we've, done, we've done the path integral over B in some gradient expansion of time. Uh, so that this part in the red square brackets, we know what it is. And we only have this guy here. Uh, and this thing, since we did a time derivative, you know, assume things were varying slowly as a function of, uh, of time, let's also assume they very slowly as a function of space. So what will that term give you? Well, that term will give you then, if you just uh, take, uh, you know, it has only spatial structure, it has no time derivative. So what you can see that this will give you uh, some integral over all space, lattice spacing is one, so I have integral over all of space. Uh, so then as the size is just constant, uh, basically uh, I'll get here terms uh, from nearest neighbor, each side has exactly Z nearest neighbors, and you can see uh, either by taking the inverse of W or just from putting psi equals constant that what you will get uh, is mod psi squared over Z W. Okay, that's what this inverse turns out to be. Uh, and then there'll be gradient correction. So there'll be some K3 uh, grad psi squared, no spatial gradient. And what is K3? Well, it determines, you know, you have to take a Fourier transform and figure out the eigenvalues of W and take its inverse and so on. And anyway, you can work out what K3 is. Okay, so but now we know this This gives you one over ZW plus K3 grad size squared plus higher order derivatives. This we know. So we put everything together and now we have a field theory. Meaning is defined in space and time, continuum space and time with the assumption that everything's varying slowly on the scale of the lattice spacing. And this field theory is a field theory for a complex scalar field, complex field depending on space and time, with some Lagrangian, you know, so particle theorists can start getting, uh, you know, start feeling they're in some familiar ground. Uh, then these are the two time derivatives, k1 psi star d psi d tau, k2 d psi d tau squared, k3 grad psi squared, and then the constant term. So the one over ZW comes from the W inverse uh, and the chi naught comes from the perturbation theory of H naught and this little u uh, we saw before. Okay. So first thing we notice, if I ignore the spatial derivatives, this is just like the Landau Ginzburg action functional. Uh, the, what's different from the superconductivity case is that these spatial terms are, the time derivative terms are very different. We had such a term even in Landau Ginzburg theory for superconductivity. But here we are, you know, and the reason they are, they're different because we're talking about a different physical phenomena. Here we have a Bose field that's condensing out of a mod insulator. In a superconductor, you had a Bose field condensing out of a Fermi liquid. Uh, so that changes some other things. But if I just apply mean field theory to this, this is some potential V of psi. Uh, and when this coefficient is positive, it looks like this. So psi is zero. And when this coefficient is uh, negative, you get this inver Mexican hat potential. And therefore the phase boundary between the insulator, this is the insulator, this is the superfluid, is when this goes to zero. And that in fact is a complete derivation with very few tricks uh, of this phase boundary, which I didn't really get honestly last time. So this phase boundary is precisely the, to get this phase boundary, uh, as we said last time, it's chi zero equals one over ZW, uh, where, chi, where chi zero, uh, we just computed in second order perturbation theory. So the most complicated calculation we had to do was second order perturbation theory in psi. 
and, and you just plug this in and, and, and you'll get all of these uh, uh, you'll get all of these lobes here for any for each value of n you get one parabola and they all meet this way and so on so it's fun to work that out uh, and check that I didn't make a mistake. <laughs> Of course, they, they, this is not exact. I mean, these phase boundaries will move, and uh, once you go to this, is just the mean field result, which now we've gotten in three different ways. All right. So now the main question is, what are K one and K two? <laughs> one thing. Okay, let me just uh, say one thing. Uh, when k1 is zero, if this term wasn't there, if k1 was zero, then particle theorists can celebrate because this is a relativistic field theory. It's just we call uh, lambda fivefold field theory with two component field or one complex scalar. Uh, and there's books written, you know, they know a lot about such scalar fields, uh, and you're getting a relativistic theory. So this is, if k1 was zero, you have something you never expected. You know, starting with some boring condensed matter system on a lattice, uh, and at low energies, it's a relativistic, it has an emergent relativistic invariance. It has a new symmetry that the underlying lattice model didn't have. It's an emergent symmetry of relativistic invariance, provided K1 is zero. Uh, okay, so we'll just, uh, I think I'll stop here, and uh, on Monday, we can say more about where is K1 zero. Uh, because then we can turn into particle theorists and start learning things about our system uh, from relativistic field theory. Okay, questions. Uh, that's all I have to say today. Hey, Subir, can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, so this notion of like considering kind of like slowly varying um, degrees of freedom, the low energy of degrees of freedom seems to be yeah. kind of heuristically connected to adiabatic elimination, uh, which is a common method in quantum optics and uh, atomic physics. Is there any kind of yeah. rigorous connection there? It seems uh, like this yeah. is kind of a continuous version of that in a sense. Right. I mean, uh, so in fact, this term here, this, this is this is sometimes called the Berry phase term. It is precisely the Berry phase you get in adiabatic time evolution in a background field. Uh, and this, these are these terms are more higher order corrections that come when you're not quite adiabatic. So the leading term, so the in the adiabatic method, the leading term, which is just the Berry phase, uh, is the first order time derivative, and everything else is a correction. Yeah. So it's it's similar to that. Uh, I mean, we're asking different questions, and we're interested in the full path integral of a many-body system. Uh, yeah, I, but, I guess uh, like is is there a rigorous expansion parameter that permits you to do this, or is it, it or is no. that uh, kind of a, an RG argument? It's an RG argument. There is no rigorous expansion parameter. So yeah, ultimately, okay. we have to uh, what justifies all of this. Uh, is the fact that uh, the gap closes near this point, uh, and so the relevant excitations become lower and lower energy, so meaning they're varying slower and slower in time. I see. Uh, so, so as long so we can, since we're only interested in the low energy excitations, we we just do a gradient expansion to figure out what the what the action controlling them is. Cool. Uh, yeah. But. But it's not, we are under no control. The closer we get to the phase boundary, uh, the less our control becomes. Uh, because the only control for perturbation theory formally is the gap. Once you have a gap, you know, once you have a gap like this in the more insulated, then it's under control. So we have kind of assumed there's a gap, and then we are kind of try to and do some expansion, adiabatic expansion relative to the gap. Then we get a theory, and then we kind of uh, try to see if it makes sense, even in a regime yeah, where right. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the, you know, this is a, these are now tricks people like me do on a daily basis, but they were, uh, you know, the whole RG philosophy was invented to understand why these tricks make sense. So. Yeah. Thanks. Makes sense. <laughs>
Any other questions? Um, I have a question about the berry phase term you mentioned. Um, yes. Uh, so, like, usually, like, berry phase is associated with some gauge field. Is there, like, some gauge field coupling here? Not necessarily a gauge field. I mean, here, what the, the, the essence of the berry, okay, you have to have a time evolution in a closed loop that isn't there, but basically you have a time dependent uh, Hamiltonian. So if you go back to this Hamiltonian and make psi time dependent, uh, uh, imagine so so psi is a very slowly slow function of time. We had imaginal time, but real time similar. The so psi is a very slow function of time. So I have a Hamiltonian with an external field which is slowly varying. So then I can ask, you know, what is the leading order term for the time evolution operator? Uh, and, and that's some phase, uh, which is gauge dependent. So here we just, you know, we have an obvious, yeah, I mean, we're, there is some gauge invariance here, uh, but because we are doing the partition function in closed loops, we don't have to, you know, we are coming back to the same point. And, and that berry phase that you pick up uh, when, when psi involves in some periodic way in time, and psi, in fact, is periodic in time in the path integral that's implicit in the current state uh, in this path integral here. The berry phase you pick up for that time evolution of psi uh, for that periodic evolution uh, is precisely the time integral of this term. And K1 is the the number that tells you how much berry phase you're going to pick up in that process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it, sorry. Uh, is this like a measurable thing? Because the like, psi wasn't there initially. Like, we brought it in by by some transformation. So, like, is this berry phase like a physical berry phase which you can measure? Or um... yeah, it is. It's it's basically, um, you know. You have to relate it to some observable, but yes, I mean it's the it's how the phase uh, of the boson or the superfluid processes due to a change in local density. Yeah, you know, it's it's what leads to the Josephson type effects. Uh, yeah, so it, it's measurable. Okay, thanks. I mean, there's not a language that people doing the experiments use, but okay, <laughs> I was just making an analogy to time-dependent Hamiltonians. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, another thing, you know, you might say, well, psi is not measurable. It's just some tricky thing that you introduce to do a hubbard schroeder noise transformation. Well, you can fix that. So what you have to do is, suppose you want to really measure some correlation function of B. So to measure a correlation function of B, you have to introduce a source term for B. So you, you would add another term here, some source, some source term, some minus J times B which the source could some external source, which could be function of time and space. And then by looking at the response of the partition function of J, you can figure out what the correlations of B are, which you can then measure. Well, you would put the source term in the hubbard stranowitz transformation, and that will give you in the end when the dust settles some other source term for psi, which will not just be J, but be related to J. So then you can convert via this trick Correlation functions of B to correlation functions of psi. And to leading order, they're just roughly proportional to each other. But you can even get the constants and all the corrections. That's kind of a tedious procedure, but okay. That's what you, but to leading order for just the most important things near the critical point, especially, you could think of psi as just equal to B up to some proportionality constant. Hi, I have a question. If yes. um, if we included like next nearest neighbors or further interactions, would yes. that affect the one over Z uh, W or would it come in only at the K3 term? Uh, it will affect the one over Z W, yeah. Okay, so the mean field boundaries would also shift. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, got it, thank uh, you. As they would in the mean field theory also. I mean, if you just did the naive factorization of second neighbor terms, you'll see that it does give you a contribution.
in the simplest mean field theory, basically, uh, you know, what happens is that ZW, oops, uh, ZW just get replaced by uh, sum over all neighbors of a given site. Take a site uh, of, let's say, site zero of W uh, zero I. So I is basically all the neighbors of site zero. And you just pick out the matrix element between that. And that's that's what you pick up, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Subir, I have another question. So uh, yeah. we saw that if we proceed, uh, if we try and diagnose the space boundary moving from the mod insulator to the superfluid, we got this really yeah. nice um, field theory, single dynamical field, get this effective, yeah. uh, effective Lagrangian. Can you get yeah. do a similar procedure, um, but coming from the other side, from superfluid to um, to mod insulator? Like there, you would you know just decouple the density interaction, and I'm curious if. Uh, you know, you get some kind of similar analysis that uh, you get some field theory, maybe not for a single dynamical field, but some field theory that you can extract some parameter that will ensure the gap is closing or opening rather. Um, or if there's like an instability of yeah. uh, of the superfluid on the other side that signals where the phase boundary should be. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, the general answer is no. Uh, and this, uh, and then that's because uh, uh, you always want to uh, want to start from the site where the symmetry is preserved. The superfluid, the, the, the whole, if you later on, you know, or maybe you can already see, uh, once you get sophisticated about these things and you've met enough of these phase conditions, you can pretty much guess everything in here from symmetry. The fact that psi goes to each side and g to the i phi. Uh, and this are the only terms that are allowed. And, uh, and then there's some gauge invariance argument that we're going to discuss uh, next lecture. So, so what we've learned is that whenever you are trying to fully understand what's going on uh, in some theory uh, at different energy scales, you want to start from the side where you have full symmetry of the underlying model and then work towards it, towards the other phase where you might break the symmetry. Uh, so in this case, the mod insulator has the full symmetry. So that's where we want to start and think about its instability. So you uh, basically want to start where you have the order parameter that is uh, like covariant under the, the uh, gauge transformation or uh, the- Well, not psi be the right is zero, psi is, uh, you know, you want to, you want to start here uh, and then uh, and then look at fluctuations. If I, you started here and look at fluctuations, you, you don't know anything about that point and you're going to run into a big mess. Yeah. I mean, this was, you know, Weinberg's insight for the Higgs phenomenon or gauge theories of Higgs phenomenon there. You know, we, we, they had a theory of weak interaction. It looked really ugly because you were sitting here uh, where the Higgs field was condensed. Uh, but if you realize, oh, well, let's just start over here and think about it. And then you get the standard model. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, you want to start from where you have the most symmetry and where, the, where you can see the full structure and then break it if you need to. Okay. So Thanks. that's the general answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but in this case, in two dimensions, actually, there is a dual theory where you start from the superfluid uh, and you go to the... Uh, to the to the mod insulator. Uh, and, and that's because there's some duality transformations where even in the dual, th even in the superfluid phase, you, you have some knowledge of the symmetry and you get a theory of vortices and you think right on an action for the vortices and how the vortices uh, will proliferate as you go into the mod insulator. Uh, but that only works in certain cases. I guess like, I, 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 yeah, cool. Um... So I, I wonder, like, but uh, so, uh, you know, uh, be, aside from getting some nice field theory for the critical behavior at the transition, can you still diagnose from the instabilities of the superfluid uh, quasi-particles where the phase boundary might be? Uh, 
like you know uh, you may not be interested in finding some duality um at the level of the fields but you may just want yeah, to calculate yeah, where, the, where the transition will be oh yeah so what you would calculate then is the stiffness so we we, we introduce this uh, so this twist you twist you take a superfluid and you twist it and then you get this uh, helicity modulus and you calculate it and then I you see. find where it goes to zero where it goes to zero will give you the phase boundary to the model insulator. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. That's, that's wonderful. Cool. Okay. Great. So uh, have a great weekend. I won't see you tomorrow. But how are you? Thank you. We'll do that session. I do want to get one weekend off. <laughs> and uh, see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>